Hello, and welcome to the B'nai B'rith International Podcast. I'm CEO Dan Mariash. Thanks for spending some time with us today. On today's episode, I'm excited to speak with Lucy Adlington, author of The Dressmakers of Auschwitz, The True Story of the Women Who Sewed to Survive. Adlington's new book introduces us to a group of brave and determined women who stitched to survive the concentration camps and which brings fresh insights into the continually evolving history of the Holocaust. But first, one quick reminder, check out our video interview series, Conversations with B'nai B'rith on Facebook and YouTube. You'll find discussions with historians, diplomats, Middle East experts, even an astronaut and an NFL player and a legendary DJ. And watch our latest content by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel and liking us on Facebook at B'nai B'rith International. For author and historian Lucy Adlington, what started out nearly 20 years ago as a research project focusing on links between the textile industry and the Holocaust became a book detailing how 25 young female inmates of the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp powered a fashion workshop for elite Nazi women. It may seem discordant, but imagine Jewish women prisoners creating beautiful dresses for their oppressors amidst the unthinkable horrors of the Nazi death camps. And that's why I'm glad to welcome Adlington to the program today. She'll be sharing these powerful stories of the women who used their sewing skills to cheat death. Her book, The Dressmakers of Auschwitz, The True Story of Women Who Sewed to Survive, chronicles the long hidden and extraordinary histories of these fierce women. Lucy Adlington is an author, presenter, and historian. She writes in several different genres, including historical fiction and fascinating social history, and has previously published several nonfiction and fiction books, including Great War Fashion, Fashion, Women in the First World War, and The Red Ribbon. Lucy, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hello. It's lovely to have the chance to speak with you. Well, you're a fashion historian, which is a profession not everyone is aware of. And it was not your original field of study at Oxford, where you were an English major, focusing on the literature of atrocity. What drew you to fashion and clothes? And what can we learn from generally from the study of attire if we know what to look for? It is true that I've had many different interests, but I think the feeling behind them all and the intellectual curiosity behind them all is all focused on finding stories that perhaps haven't been told or haven't been seen and particularly uncovering more about lives in the past that haven't made it into the usual records and for me the last 20 years of looking at clothes history because I have to say although I'm aware of fashion it's clothes that interest me you know there is a difference really I suppose between fashion as the ever-changing um, whims and commercial drives of clothing and then clothes as objects you know the garments that are so intimate and so public and particularly for women's history which is where I focus clothing and aspects around clothing are a really useful way of looking at lives that haven't perhaps existed so much in documents or in public monuments, which I think makes a very good connection with looking at what, when I was an undergraduate, um, what was called the literature of atrocity was how people have found, tried to find ways to express what seems inexpressible. Or in my case, I was looking for the fragments of writings and objects left behind by victims of the Holocaust and looking to see you know what what resonates from them so really it's a way of salvaging people from history so that they're not forgotten and bringing those two together has been absolutely fascinating. Now you've amassed a, a sizable garment collection over the years uh, can you tell us why you started collecting uh, what you look for in items that that you acquire and uh, as it relates to the book have you been able to find anything which might have been made at Auschwitz-Birkenau, uh, if that's even possible? There are a lot of things in my collection, um, which I suppose I started out of a love for the garments. 
I started because I see something. I think that's a wonderful example of tailoring or dressmaking skills, or I love it as a garment. But a lot of my collection is actually made up of things that I've acquired that come with a personal story. So I've been don donated a lot of items over the years that come sometimes with photographs, sometimes with a history and so on. And they are my favorites, the ones that connect very personally. And of course, when I was writing this book, The Dressmakers of Auschwitz, that is the question, isn't it? What survives from these beautiful garments, which were made in, in this elite fashion salon? It was based in the SS admin block at Auschwitz. And to my knowledge, no garments are known to have survived. And provenance with clothing is, is very complex. I mean, sometimes you have a label in your clothes, but really the SS were not going to have a label put on saying made in Auschwitz. The whole idea was to render German occupied territories due free, not to celebrate their achievements. And I, I was in contact with the, um, the grandson of Hedwig Huss, the commandant's wife of Auschwitz, who had established the salon. And I said, do you know if any of the garments survive? And he said, to his knowledge, no. I mean, why would she keep why would she keep garments from the 1940s anyway, as she moved into later decades? And only one garment, to my knowledge, survives in the Huss family that has an Auschwitz collection connection, rather. And that's a waistcoat that was taken, appropriated from the plunder warehouses at Auschwitz and given to the youngest Huss boy. So we don't know. There could be clothes out in the vintage markets of Europe that were stitched by the Jewish inmates of the, the fashion salon. And that is one of the poignant things about clothes is that we don't always know the stories they hold. Uh, these were immensely talented women uh, who um, were, were brought into, into this um, uh, salon. Uh, as I mentioned in my introduction, uh, you began this process researching the historical connection between the textile industry and the Holocaust, but you've ended up crafting a book about these indomitable women who used their considerable skills and talents and survived. You know, I in my synagogue, there's a, a survivor uh, who was uh, 13 years old in 1941 uh, when the roundups began in her town in Lithuania. So she was 13 years old. And uh, I'm not sure whether it was during the roundup or whether it was when they got to the next place, they were, they were put into slave labor. And um, uh, one of the women told her, and she repeats the story, and she speaks a lot around the, the Washington area. Uh, she said, tell them you can sew. Tell them you can sew, because that was seen as, as a possible uh, way uh, to survive. So tell us how the focus of your research changed, and when you realized that studying these women, you had a new and extraordinary angle and perspective uh, with which to describe the experiences of the victims who endured uh, the barbarity of the Nazi concentration camps. So it is always worthwhile to remember a very human element of a historical research project. And so although I began my research looking very broadly at um, forced labor in ghetto workshops, looking at the multitude of ways in which skills could, textile skills could help someone survive, someone Jewish survive, it was, I mean, and, and I found so many examples. And for women in particular, well, for women, the trades that they were likely to have upon arrival at a concentration camp or a labor camp they had a much narrower range of skills that the SS would deem important. Sewing would be one. But if you think of other traditionally female skills at this time, such as you know, motherhood and caring skills, uh, secretarial skills were sometimes used. But for, for one of those skills that um, was valued, that could give you the right to life, sewing was one of them. The Germans had a huge skill shortage in, in factory workshops, creating uniforms and civilian clothing and so on. But yes, it's one thing to look at the broader economical and historical context, but then to be able to, to make a connection not only with the past for oneself, but also with readers. There is something incredibly 
humanizing about a garment, an element of clothing. And we may all have memories, perhaps, of members of our own families sitting sewing. I think of my grandmother at her treadle sewing machine and me playing with her pins and threads. So it gives us a sense of connection, reminds us that everything that happened happened to real people in present time. And then when I was able to be in touch with the families of surviving seamstresses, the, the relatives of the dressmakers, that really was extraordinary for me to get um, so much more insight. It became so much more personal and incredibly emotional as well. It was very much the intellectual curiosity, very much saturated with those powerful emotions. And I found out so much more that you only know through either speaking with survivors or looking at personal accounts, looking to relatives, those details of history that perhaps haven't made it into grander scholarly studies. And so the stories that were shared, particularly when I was able to meet with the last surviving seamstress of the salon and ask her directly, you know, please tell me. And that was a remarkable opportunity and a remarkable experience as well. Now, sewing so much was so much infused actually into into Jewish life. Uh, my grandfather, one of my grandfathers, was a was a tailor. Um, we had a, a treadle sewing machine um, in in our uh, basement, uh, which which my father actually knew how to how to operate. Um, and there were many many stories like that. So sewing really was uh, was very much a part of the Eastern European Jewish way of life. Very much so. And it's, it's spread wherever Jewish people have traveled. I live not far from Leeds, a city in the north of England, which has a tremendous reputation for, for Jewish sewing skills and also for the whole manufacturing industry associated with fashion, with the garment trade, from design and fabric manufacture to the, the selling in department stores and boutiques. But I think with women's sewing, it's sometimes overlooked because it's seen as just so everyday and, and domestic, you know, oh, that's just, you know, our mother mending our socks or she's just running up a shirt. But it's very clear that as um, it, the growing process of Aryanization in Nazi controlled countries or in pro-fascist uh, countries with pro-fascist governments, it's clear that as people lose, lose their livelihoods, that sewing becomes a fallback as ever for women, as a way of making money and actually feeding a family. And so there are innumerable stories of women knitting and embroidering and making clothes to sell. And that, that is how they survive before deportation. So even these really humble skills, they deserve their value, I think. Five women uh, you write about had interesting lives before they arrived uh, at Auschwitz. Uh, can you give us an idea of their backgrounds, their social, political situations uh, that they were living through? Uh, it seems that for them, there were three elements which played into their fate, their persecution, uh, the culture of greed and status among the Nazi elite, uh, and the enslavement of camp inmates. So what happened to them when they arrived at the camp? I found it very interesting when I was structuring the, the immense wealth of research material for this book is seeing how all of the people featured in it, whether victims or bystanders or perpetrators, how their paths all came together, their journeys all brought them to that one place and that one time. For many of the dressmakers, they, the majority were Jewish. They were majority were from Slovakia and based in Bratislava or in surrounding towns. And so they were on the first official Jewish transports to Auschwitz, one of the Eichmann transports. And they arrived in March and April 1942. And by this point, Hedwig Huss, the commandant's wife, was already very well established in her stolen house with stolen goods. And so the book does chart not only these the great economic forces and the political forces, that affect these young women's lives. But I think it's also really lovely to see how they grow up. Many of them in very poor families, actually, in, in a particular Jewish street of Bratislava. And I think of the children tumbling in and out of each, other, each other's houses. And many of them have artisan parents. So they're working as tailors and shoemakers and so on. But nothing, of course, can prepare them for arrival in Auschwitz. And 
It's also very interesting at this point to see how much clothes are part of Nazi strategies to dehumanize new arrivals. So people may say, well, you know, it's just fashion, it's just clothes. Why are you writing about them when you're talking about genocide? I think, no, when these young women arrive, it's deliberate that they are stripped and humiliated and that their clothes take away their identity and their modesty, their dignity. And that whole process is absolutely part of the deliberate process of victimization. And then to give them, in, in this case, these early prisoners were given filthy Russian uniforms that had been taken from the bodies of murdered Russian POWs. So already their world has been absolutely turned upside down. And these are very young women. Some of them haven't had a lot of experience away from home. So really the ways in which they adapt once they arrive, it's extraordinary how they manage. And this is where their resilience and their friendships come through. And at first there are no needles. To have a needle is verboten. You're not permitted as a prisoner to have a needle, but the women manage to wangle needles. They try and make their clothes more presentable. And many, many inmates speak about that desire to regain a sense of dignity and, and humanity through improving the way they look and hoping that they will be treated better. If they look more human, perhaps they might be treated as human, which of course we know is, is, is a vain hope for most, most people in the camps. And I mean, I could go on. I'm going to carry on talking to you about this. Oh, brother, so much I could tell you. No, no, the, I just, uh, just a note, you know, what, you, what you say about, about uh, the, the, the dehumanization process. I mean, clearly uh, the Germans were, uh, were obsessed uh, by the idea of, of uh, dehumanizing before killing. Um, and um, and you've just you've just described that. I'm curious to know. Uh, they arrived in 1942, and and from Slo mainly from Slovakia, and that was a deportation, if I recall correctly, of a thousand Jewish women. Uh, that was a, um, an, a a deportation by uh, the uh, Slovak um, puppet government, and it came it came relatively early, 1942. So I, I'm guessing. That that these women must have been part of that of the thousand who came in at that time. Do you do you know more about that? The, the thousand was the there was a train from Ravensbrück women women's camp that came in at the same time. I think um, there were four of the initial transports from uh, two holding places in Slovakia at this time, and so I've been able to track down where possible which transports the women were on, and they were on those initial four transports and as such they were well they were the first women in the camps and the camp was was barely ready for them they were also considered low numbers so they had the longest time to attempt to survive of, of any women in Auschwitz the death rates as as you'll be aware were appallingly high but for these Slovakian women they had the advantage I suppose of being amongst the first and being able to hopefully adapt and form communities that could then look for ways to survive. And, and a lot of those ways to survive involve looking for more privileged work because initially they were all involved in hard labor. There was no question of them sewing. They were working in quarries and on construction sites. Some of them were even building the new gas chambers in Birkenau. And so anything that could improve their chance to survive was a godsend. And this is where clothes come in again, because a lot of the Slovakian prisoners, and this is men too who are being deported later on in 1942, they, they're put to work in the plunder warehouses. Vast, vast mounds of appropriated goods. And they're put to work sorting through clothes, which are then shipped back to Germany. And even here, the SS starts saying, oh, I like the look of that garment. I'll have it altered. And some of the Slovakian women, some of the women I've been writing about, they were made into little pet dressmakers, even in the plunder warehouses. And yet it's Hedvig Huss who really, I think, epitomizes the attitude of utter greed and privilege. Whatever she wants from these plunder warehouses, she gets. And she needs seamstresses. And since she's reluctant to pay the local Polish women that she's current, she's until this date had in her house, she begins to use one of the Slovak women, a woman named Marta Fuchs, who actually ran her own salon in, in Slovakia 
before she was deported. And Marta is so good and she's so canny, she's so clever that she starts suggesting to Hedvig, oh, we need more help with the sewing. I'm going to need a young girl to help. And I know someone who can do your hair and I know someone who can knit for you. And in this way, Marta was able to use her privilege to save others, which is an amazing opportunity. How were they chosen uh, to to work? Uh, I, um, I, I guess there was there there were questions that were asked about you know what did you do or what 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 is your um, uh, vocation? But how did that actually work? Uh, you've just explained actually how one person brought in several. Was it uh, was it that way, or was there some kind of more of a method to the madness here? I don't think there was a method. I think it was chaotic. And uh, Bracha Berkovic um, said, if you didn't have any contacts, you didn't have any luck. She said there were so many more talented seamstresses than her. And I know, of, for example, one woman who'd worked for the great house of Chanel in Paris before the war. Well, she didn't have that luck. It was to do with contacts, with family connections and friendships. And no, it, it wasn't. It wasn't. Um, there was no method. It was a question of who could put themselves forward, who was in the right place at the right time, who had the right face. And it was a, a permanent hustle, a permanent hustle to be on the right side of luck. You were able to interview uh, one of the women who worked uh, in this salon. Can you tell us about that experience? Um, how willing was she uh, to speak with you? And had she previously shared her story with her family or perhaps spoken in public about her experience? Because we know that some survivors did and some survivors were reluctant and hesitant to do so. What was your uh, experience with that? Yes, of course, there, there are so many differences. Um, and it was clear to me from, from the, the, the core group of dressmakers that I was researching, one of them said almost nothing about her experiences and she she took her secrets to the grave and she had been asked to testify at various post-war trials and she refused to do so for, for, for her own reasons. Other women did give video testimony um, as part of the, the Shoah video testimony program. And the, the lady I went to interview, Mrs. Kohut in San Francisco, at first she hadn't said a word to her family, to her young boys when they were growing up first in post-war Czechoslovakia and then they moved to the USA. She didn't want them even to know they were Jewish. And she compartmentalized all her experiences as many people do with trauma. But eventually the, her boys learned that she had been in the camps and when she was older, she particularly wanted to revisit her childhood in the pre-war years and to talk about her loved ones who'd been murdered. So many of her family were murdered in the Shoah. And then when I got in touch saying, you know, please may I come and visit and speak with you, she was ready to talk, very much so. In fact, she just said, you listen. And I just, I, I just had to, you know, keep keep up with her. Really, she was very ready to talk, and yet it was it was clear that a lot was still compartmentalized. And there were times when I would ask a question, and she would almost shut down, thinking, "I'm not going there." And I thought, "Okay, you know, we have to respect that." So even after so many years, and she was she was 98 years old at the time that we met, there were still some things that were untouchable in her mind that only came out at night when her defenses were down. But she was a very, she's very bright, multilingual, very ready to talk and very, very welcoming. And I think that comes across in the book, so many stories and snippets. Well, fortunately, uh, some of the seamstresses whose stories you tell uh, left written accounts of their time at Auschwitz. What happened to them after the war? Yeah, that was really interesting. For the longest time, um, there was there was nothing, and then one of the women called Hunya, who's a Slovakian woman who had been deported on the last Jewish transport from Leipzig. She had a, a dressmaking salon there. After the war, she settled in Israel and was dressmaking again. And her niece used to go around and visit. And her niece said one day for a school project, "Will you tell me about your experiences before the war and in the camps?" And so Hunya said, "Okay." And Hunya sat and sewed, and Hunya's niece, Gila, sat and wrote. And she created 
even just as a teenager, she created this extraordinary document of Hunya's memoirs. But Hunya had also been in touch with a, a Holocaust scholar, herself a survivor, uh, who had been in the SS administration block as a, as a Jewish inmate. And this is Dr. Laura Shelley. And Dr. Shelley from the 1980s onwards had essentially dedicated her academic life to collecting people's testimonies. And amongst them was Hunya's. And I, I had a very interesting time in the archives in San Francisco, discovering so many more. Do you know, there's something about history that is still tactile, even when it's words and concepts, just rustling through the papers and seeing handwritten letters and postcards and little notes. It was an incredibly personal experience. And so these Dr. Dr. Shelley's archives were immensely interesting. And one name always leads to many more. And there are still more, still more that, to follow that I'm looking forward, as COVID restrictions lift, looking forward to discovering more. Well, all of these women survived Auschwitz uh, because of their dressmaking skills, as well as faith and luck uh, and friendship, uh, the friendship and the support of, of, their, of their friends and their, their fellow workers. Uh, many were able uh, to use those skills to reestablish their dignity and their livelihood and make beautiful clothes for their families. What do you think this says about the inner strength of these dressmakers? Resilience is a word that is used time and again, and I think it's entirely justified. And of course, there were resilient inmates who didn't have the luck or they didn't have the right contacts or you know, they succumb to typhus rather than surviving it. You know, there's so many variables, but the resilience is very noticeable in the post-war years. And I very deliberately didn't stop at liberation. I wanted to look at how the women reclothed themselves in civilian clothes after the war and how they restarted businesses, how they sewed for their families and how they kept their, their bonds together after the war and how they helped each other through trauma. But it struck me that you know, it really isn't a happy ending, of course, is it? It isn't a, a, a romantic meeting at a train station, even though there were reunions and there were marriages, because all of the women carried that trauma with them. They carried the, the physical and emotional trauma. But I was struck by how many different sources commented on when they had reunions, they would get together, usually at somebody's apartment, and they would talk and laugh. That friendship was still there, overriding all of the hate and the bitterness and the brutality. And that was pushed, pushed away. And so, yes, resilience is very much a core characteristic. And those dressmakers who did survive, not all of them did, many of them lived to be in their 80s and 90s and had very, very full lives and passed on a lot of love and wisdom to the next generations and are, are remembered very fondly by their families. And of course, there are still, still more women that I haven't tracked down, so who knows? Well, I've been privileged uh, to have met many survivors over the years, and uh, I, resilience is the word. I, and I always try to imagine, even though I've had conversations with many about their experiences, to, it's very hard. We cannot put ourselves uh, in their shoes at all. Um, but but um, you always think about how it is that they were able to endure day to day, day to day over this period of years. Um, and it's, it's amazing. And the women that you write about certainly fall into, into that category, as all, as all survivors do. Uh, there, are, there are many ways uh, to remember and speak about the Holocaust. And you bring a, a fresh perspective and a to this uh, with the dressmakers of Auschwitz. What do you hope that readers will take away and understand about the Shoah and the inhumanity of the Nazis? What do you, what do you think it is that, that is the most important message, in addition to telling the stories, of course, the most important message that you'd like readers to, to take away from the book? Wow, that is an interesting question. Of course, as a historian, I hope that readers will appreciate the immense amount of context there is, that this, um, 
the, the fashion salon in Auschwitz, in fact, Auschwitz itself as a profit making enterprise didn't come out of nowhere. So seeing how all the choices of people deliberately led to that brutality, to that degradation and murder. And then, oh my goodness, I love, I love the fact that it centers the female experience and women who perhaps would have been seen as ordinary in real life. I mean, you know, you ask how would we have survived? We don't know. But in many ways, although these women are very special to me, they're very special to their families, they were in many ways ordinary women too. They survived because they had to and because they had the chance to. And so I suppose what I would like readers to take is a, is a tremendous sense of compassion, compassion for what was endured and also that it was love that helped them endure it, love and loyalty. And yes, one reviewer has said the book is written with cold fury which I think is a reasonable comment. I, yes, compassion, but also still anger and a sense that this didn't happen in a vacuum. It didn't happen by accident. And these little actions that we now do day to day, we can make a more cohesive and supportive community or we can emphasize differences, tribalism, us and them, the bigotry, the discrimination, the anti-Semitism. So I do think it is still... I think it's still very relevant now. Who are we going to be? Are we going to be the collaborative dressmakers who looked out for each other? Or are we going to be the privileged SS type of people who think only of their own gain and their own pleasure and their own profit? So very big questions, but I do hope that readers appreciate this, this fresh insight. And I hope that, uh, well, I know that the families of the seamstresses have been really pleased that their mothers and aunts and grandmothers will not be forgotten. And perhaps that's the most important thing of all. Well, the book is The Dressmakers of Auschwitz, The True Story of the Women Who Sewed to Survive by Lucy Adlington. And it's available now wherever you purchase books. Lucy, we appreciate your being here and introducing us to a little known aspect of the Holocaust, World War II, The Women Who Sewed to Stay Alive, and for that, we're truly grateful. Best of luck to you. Thank you very much, Dan. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. Well, if you're looking for more of our diverse content, visit our website, benebrit.org, to listen to all of our conversations, podcasts, and live interviews. Thanks to author and historian Lucy Adlington for joining me today. And as always, thank you for listening. If you like what you've heard, make sure you subscribe to the B'nai B'rith podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. I'm your host, Dan Mary Ashen. Talk to you again soon.